to give you some background to, to understand why we did this study. Uh, Pernatinib is, is a very effective drug. It's, it's what we call a third generation tyrosine kinase inhibitor. It, uh, it's very uh, potent, very uh, effective. Uh, it's the only one that we have available today that works against this mutation uh, called T315I. Um, none of the other ones work there. Uh, it, and it works against the other mutations. It has uh, a high response rate even on patients who have received two or three prior tyrosine kinase inhibitors, 60, 70% of patients respond. So very high efficacy. The problem is that when we did the initial study that was called the PACE study, uh, we uh, eventually learned that there were some uh, patients that developed uh, what we call arterial occlusive events. And th these can be either cardiac, uh, meaning heart attacks and angina and things like that, cerebrovascular, like, like strokes and transient ischemic attacks, or peripheral vascular, uh, gangrene and, and things like that. Um, we didn't realize that this happens with all the TKIs, and after that, we've learned that it's a, it's a class effect. It happens more with panathenia, but it happens with the others. But anyway, because of that, we started having this struggle of, of a, a very potent drug, very useful drug, but, but limited because of, these, of the risk of developing these things, mostly in patients that have other uh, risk factors for these events, but still, you know, many patients do, and you still have to treat them. Um, and through analysis of the data we had and modeling and all of that, we, we uh, came to the hypothesis that there was perhaps some correlation between the dose and the, and the risk of developing these events. And so, so the, the thinking was, can we use a, a, a lower dose and maintain the efficacy while uh, decreasing the risk of developing these events so that we can benefit patients who need uh, a drug like ponatinib. So then that was, that was where OPTIC came, which was a randomized study where uh, patients with, with CML who had received prior uh, TKIs and, and had the developed resistance were um, at random assigned to receive either the standard dose, which is 45 milligrams daily, or uh, 30 milligrams daily, or 15 milligrams daily. So three different uh, doses. Um, and um, so, so the, the idea was to see if patients would reach a, a level of response, the transcripts of 1% or less. Um, one important component of the study was that once we had, once the patients achieved that response, it was mandatory to reduce their dose to 15 milligrams daily. So, so that, again, to try to minimize the risk. Um, so that's the, the, the design, that was the concept uh, behind it. And, um, and what we found on this study was that um, 45 milligrams is indeed the most effective dose. Uh, the, the difference in, in the response rate um, was, uh, and, and this is an interim analysis what we presented so far, uh, but it already uh, tells us that by one year, um, ne nearly 40% of patients have achieved the response with a standard dose, whereas with the other lower doses, um, it's, it's less than 30%. So, so there's a big gap there in, in, the, um, in the response rate. Um, and in terms of the uh, risk of developing these events, um, the, there was some decrease with the lower doses, but not quite as much. So only 5% of patients developed these events with a, with a standard dose and 4% with the 30 milligrams. So it dropped by just 1%. Um, and, and then it, it was 1% with the 15 milligrams. So uh, it looks like there is something to gain in terms of safety with a lower dose, but it doesn't match what you lose with the, um, with the uh, in terms of efficacy, in terms of response rate. So, so it, it, it shows now one thing that, 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 that we notice is that with that mandatory reduction in the dose, looks like the overall incidence of these events was much lower than we expected. So, and, and that's perhaps why we didn't see that big of a gap in, in, in the safety because we reduced the risk already perhaps by these lower uh, lowering of the dose once the patients responded instead of keeping them always at the 45 milligrams.
I think the advantage of this is that now we understand better what's the best way to manage um, this drug, and 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 that way we we can offer it to patients who need it because it's a very effective drug, but we can minimize the risk. So we understand that yes, 45 milligrams still is the standard dose. Um, you know, for a while we were using um, a kind of. Uh, uh, um, uh, out of fear, we were using 15 or 30 milligrams as the starting dose or even avoiding the drug altogether um, empirically. Um, so now we understand that it's better to start at 45 milligrams, but monitor your patients and, assume, and, and once they respond, lower the dose. Uh, and and so, so learning how to use the, what's the best way to use the drug, uh, I think we can benefit the patients who need it. So um, you know, ponatinib is not a drug for frontline, so that's that's not its its place. But now the patients who develop resistance to other drugs, we can we can use ponatinib. Uh, you know, the practitioners out, out there in in the community managing these patients now can 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 feel more comfortable on on how how to properly treat those patients, give provide the benefit, but minimize the risks. Of course, we have also learned that it's very important to manage other risk factors. I mean, if the patient is diabetic, to manage the diabetes, if they have high blood pressure, to manage the blood pressure, you know, all these other things.